Hello, my name is Scott Gaynor, uh, and I'm delighted to be here to provide you with an introduction to the conceptual foundations and practice of clinical behavior analysis. Uh, I'm a professor at Western Michigan University in the Department of Psychology, where I'm also the co-director of our APA-accredited PhD program in clinical psychology. I'd like to start by kind of breaking down the term clinical behavior analysis. Clinical behavior analysis, uh, in terms of the clinical part, is clinical in the same way that applied behavior analysis is applied. We address socially significant problems. It's behavioral in that we consider our clients' thoughts, feelings, and actions all to be behavior. And that while one behavior may influence a subsequent behavior, the ultimate causes of behavior are in the environment, necessitating that we take our analyses back to environmental antecedents that occur before behavior and the consequences that occur after behavior. <clears throat> Clinically, where we see these is the critical importance of our descriptive functional analyses where we try to understand how clinically relevant behavior is maintained by its antecedents and consequences, and the importance of that is it points us to manipulable variables that we can alter to have an influence on their lives. I see clinical behavior analysis as an extension of applied behavior analysis to predominantly verbally based interventions provided to verbally able clients who are seeking services for problems like depression, anxiety, the kinds of things we see in typical outpatient care. Clinical behavior analysis clearly had its roots in the 60s and 70s in the work of Gold Diamond, Salzinger, Krasner, Greenspoon, uh, and Charles Furster, who we'll talk about in a little more detail later. But it really took form in the 80s and the early 90s. It's always hard to date these things, but one reasonable marker is the special section in the Behavior Analyst in the fall of 1993 dedicated to clinical behavior analysis. Now the conceptual and uh, sort of practical challenge for the clinical behavior analyst is to understand how a verbal interchange between two people impacts direct contingencies in people's lives outside the therapy room. Right? So what we're typically dealing with is the interaction of verbal and nonverbal events. We typically don't have a lot of access to the direct contingencies in people's daily life. So we need to understand how it is that talk about contingencies interacts with direct contingencies to have effects. And this people will recognize as the distinction Skinner uh, made first in 1966 between rule-governed behavior and contingency-shaped behavior. Rule-governed behavior can be described as behavior influenced by verbal descriptions of operative contingencies. So a parent tells a child, when the orange light is on the stove, don't touch the top or you'll get a burn. And that child can now behave effectively with respect to the stove without ever having contacted those contingencies. Now let's imagine another child whose parents don't give him that instruction. And he runs up to the stove, he sees the light, touches the top, and gets the burn. He has had to learn by the hard luck of direct experience uh, in the world. Now, depending on his verbal capabilities, he may step away from the stove and say, hey, when that yellow light's on, don't touch the stove or you'll get a burn. So contingency-shaped behavior can clearly lead to rule-governed behavior when people start to talk about the contingencies that influence their lives. We also know it can work the other way. You can have verbal rules that get you going in terms of contacting contingencies. We see that very often in skilled performance. When you're teaching uh, your son or daughter to drive, you might tell them when you're pressing down on the gas pedal, go slow at first and gradually work up. Or when you're applying the brakes, there's the stop sign. You kind of progressively press the brake as you head up to the stop sign. So it's initially under some rule control, but then eventually for a skilled driver, you're not thinking as you get ready to go, press the gas pedal gently, you just let the natural contingencies kind of take over. The rules have given way to natural contingencies. Uh, in this introduction of rule-governed behavior uh, and contingency-shaped behavior led to a great deal of conceptual and research work. And I've listed down here uh, kind of the main labs and authors who have done that work. I'm going to summarize some of that work with a real eye towards the clinical implications uh, of the work. But I want to give a nod to the folks who did the empirical and conceptual work down in the corner. So we certainly know that rules can be accurate or inaccurate, right? Put on your coat or you will catch a cold, 
Right? And that's not how viruses work. Uh, that's an inaccurate rule, right? Uh, stay away from sick people and wash your hands regularly. That's the accurate rule. We know that rules can expedite responding. Right? If somebody visits me in my office for the first time and they need to use the restroom, I don't start saying to them, you're cold, you're warm, you're warmer, you're getting hot. I don't, I don't shape their behavior by successive approximations to the bathroom. I tell them where to go and they get there on the first try. <clears throat> Rules can be specific or strategic. Think about the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. A strategic rule. Drink eight eight ounce glasses of water every day. A very specific rule. Think about its strategic counterpart. Drink when you're feeling thirsty. Right? What we're often interested in is how these promote or make you insensitive to environmental contingencies. Drink eight eight ounce glasses of water a day. Well, imagine you had orange juice for breakfast and a soda with lunch and a coffee along the way. You may not need eight eight ounce glasses of water. It's making you insensitive to contingencies. Right? It may be better to just go with the strategic rule in that circumstance. <clears throat> Rules can be understood and not followed. Maintain a healthy body weight. Exercise regularly. Sleep seven to eight hours a day. Drink alcohol in moderation, if at all, and don't smoke. Right? Pretty easy to understand rules. Less than 10% of Americans follow all five of those rules. Rules can be self or other generated, as we talked about. As you experience the world, you can talk to yourself. You hear other people give you rules that you now emit as speaker behavior and follow as listener behavior. And we know that rules can contribute to adaptive or maladaptive behavior. And we're going to talk about a great deal of that. But I don't want you to leave this slide thinking that accurate rules are always adaptive rules. So if you take that pill, you will get an incredible high. That may be an accurate rule. And it puts them in direct contact with contingencies. And it's pretty maladaptive. So we see here some therapeutic implications from our understanding of verbal rules. We want to generate with our clients rules that promote contact with adaptive contingencies. We can control by inaccurate and maladaptive rules and encourage assimilation by the client. Now, rules can only have an impact if they're followed. So we need to talk a little bit about the influences on rule following. Well, rule governed behavior is operant behavior, behavior controlled by its prior consequences. So we certainly want to know about our client's history of rule following is going to be relevant. What is the behavior specified in the rule? Is it in the client's repertoire? Is it high response effort? Is it an easy response to omit? Do they understand the rule? We talked about how rule understanding doesn't mean you will follow the rule, but it's pretty hard to follow the rule if you don't understand it to begin with. The credibility of the rule giver. Is this somebody who has some expertise? Or better yet, is this somebody who's given you rules in the past and when you followed them it's had good effects? Uh, or is it somebody who, yeah, most of the time what they say to me doesn't correspond with how the world works? What are the consequences specified in the rule? If the rule is going to have immediate, sizable, and probable consequences for somebody, they're more likely to follow it. And how believable is the rule? This is sort of a shorthand for talking about whether the rule has function-altering effects or whether the rule serves as a motivative operation, making compliance with the rule a little more reinforcing. Um, and so if exercising, you'll be healthy. Uh, if there's some function altering effects, engaging in that exercise may be a little more reinforcing. Or not engaging in that exercise, a little bit aversive, uh, helping to change the function of that behavior. One of the things we run into here is that self-rules tend to have high believability. We tend to trust ourselves to be on our own side. Uh, whether or not that's always the case, as we'll see, remains to be seen. And then most importantly, of course, from an operant perspective, are the consequences for rule following. And I want to make a distinction between two types of consequences for rule following. One are, is when rule following is socially mediated. And we typically refer to this as pliance or compliance. Right? Do it because I said so. Right? That's your following the rule, but simply to be compliant because there is some social control over the behavior. Or you're following it because there's a correspondence between the rule and how the world works. And those are rules that track the natural environment. So we see in here some therapeutic implications of our understanding of rule following. We want to develop our rules collaboratively with our clients. We want to fit them to the client's experience. We want to explain our treatment rationales to our clients, assess for their understanding, and try to anticipate any barriers to them following these rules. 
We want to monitor their behavior and see if they're actually tracking the natural environment and get some feedback from them about the quality of their experience here. Does it have the quality of compliance? Yeah, I did it because we sort of said I'd do it. Or did you do it and it seemed to actually contact natural reinforcers in the world when you did do it? And it's not to say that sometimes things start out as pliance and then become tracking. You might say, oh yeah, well actually it, it did work. <laughs> uh, so you do have, uh, they're not mutually exclusive kinds of categories. All right. Given the foundation we have uh, just established with respect to uh, understanding rule-governed behavior, let's talk about a specific application uh, in, in the form of behavioral activation treatment for depression, which uh, I will argue is essentially a, an effort to promote adaptive tracking. <clears throat> now let me say uh, quickly that clinical behavior analysts do not view depression as a disease entity. Uh, it's a, simply a descriptive label for us uh, to, uh, to, the, to sort of have a word for a set of experiences that people present with. And the descriptive label is only important insofar as it points us to a socially significant problem that we might want to influence. And indeed, according to the World Health Organization, their most recent global health estimates, depressive disorders are ranked as the single largest contributor to non-fatal health loss in the world. So again, an attempt to have an influence on a socially significant problem from a behavior analytic perspective. How do we understand <clears throat> depression from a behavior analytic perspective? Well, Charles Furster, in his American Psychologist paper in 1973, uh, gave us a functional analysis of depression. Now, this isn't an individual functional analysis for a specific client. This is a broad scale, general functional analysis of depression. And Furster argued the common denominator was a decreased frequency of many kinds of positively reinforced activity. So there's again your common denominator, your general functional analysis. And we can ask what behavioral processes would lead to that? Well, reduced, positively, reduced positive reinforcement immediately comes to mind. And he also pointed out how there's a tendency, once that happens, for people to start to go for small short-term reinforcers over larger, longer-term reinforcers. Now, how might a verbal interaction help? Well, Furster actually speculated about that as well. He said a verbal repertoire developed with the therapist is a means of achieving an accurate view of how the environment works. Exactly what we just talked about is rules that track the natural environment. So we can see from that general functional analysis what a general rule for treatment might be, behavioral activation. Behavioral activation emphasizes the link between activity and mood and that decreased access to reinforcers may serve a depressive function. Patterns of avoidance and withdrawal from interpersonal situations, occupational educational activities, or daily life routines minimize distress in the short term, but reduce contact with environmental reinforcers and create new problems. Increased activation is the strategy to break this cycle. So if we want to abbreviate that rule, when you face obstacles and feel down, stay active and things will improve. So our question now clinically with any one specific client is does this general functional analysis and this general rule for treatment seem to fit the life that the person in front of us is describing? And so here's an example uh, to sort of put some meat on those bones. This is an adolescent client uh, that we've treated. We'll call her Emily here. All the names have been changed uh, for confidentiality purposes. Well, several months ago, Emily reports being dumped because she's not good enough or pretty enough. She stopped going out socially, withdrawing from even supportive friends because of overlapping friendship groups with her ex. Relationships with her mom and younger sister were deteriorating. Her single mom took a second shift job and Emily had to assume extra homemaking and caregiving responsibilities. She was bitter about that, was curt and rude with her mom, which then made her feel guilty. She knows her mom is working hard to support the family and is herself stressed out. At home, Emily will retreat to her room, surf the internet or Instagram and watch TV having trouble finishing homework, studying, and getting up for school. Her attendance and grades have dipped. She feels like a loser and a failure, occasionally wondering whether life is worth living, but has strong religious convictions and says she would never take her own life. So the question's for us. Are there, is there evidence in here of a loss of reinforcement? Is there evidence of passive avoidant responding leading to secondary problems that she might be facing? If so, then, our, then now what we do is we present the rationale to Emily. And here would be our client-specific functional analysis, our application of those 
general functional analysis, the general rules for treatment. Here's how it would work for you, Emily. And we might say something like this. You've described your life as filled with loss, hurt, stress, and daily hassles. A lot of negatives and not many positives. When lives are like this, people tend to think and feel the way you do. It makes a lot of sense. You feel stuck in a downward spiral. Notice there's no defect model in there, right? The problem with Emily is not that her brain chemicals are screwed up or that she can't think about the world in a straight way, right? The problem is here she's been sort of trapped in this negative cycle, and we'll present that to her and ask her, is it like this for you, Emily? You had the breakup. You have all this stress at home. And you started avoiding your friends. You're having the thought that you're unattractive. You're feeling sad. You're isolating from your family, having the sense that you're inadequate. You're getting increasingly irritable. You're skipping school. Uh, having the thought that you're a loser, feeling increased guilt about your interactions with your mom, and are, is this the spiral that seems to characterize what you've been experiencing these last several months, right? And have a discussion with her. Does what I've said fit? Does this fit with your experience? Does this seem right to you? And if so, then we'll progress uh, to the next step, which is to give her a treatment rationale. Well, the good news is we have some really good evidence about how to help you. The first thing we need to do is get you active and engaged. We'll figure out what's most important to you and get you moving, get you back on track. Having some fun, a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction will follow. We'll do it together, step by step. What do you think? And again, try to have at this point a discussion about starting treatment. And notice in here the attempt to target the variables that we think impact rule following. If that is all going smoothly, we will then start to generate a collaborative activation plan here. And we will target the critical areas for this individual client's life or school her relationship with her family, her relationship with her friends. We'll have behaviors in here that are easy to engage in and that you can do almost every day. We'll have some that are a little harder and that you can maybe only do once a week or less regularly uh, and try to get her to commit to behaving based on a plan, not your mood. And that's the essence there of the intervention. So do we have any uh, evidence for adaptive tracking here? Well, Emily was a participant in one of our research studies, and so at the early phase of the treatment, we were taking twice weekly data. We would meet with her, and then we'd have her fill out the Beck Depression Inventory, a commonly used self-report measure of depression, in between those sessions. And so early on, what we see, and this is why the baseline period is so important to take, is that it's not uncommon for people who have been struggling, and they come into treatment with somebody who has some expertise, who says they're going to help them, starts asking them a lot of questions about what's going on in their lives, that they start to get some improvement. And we did see that with Emily. It's unfortunate from a research perspective, but it's great from a clinical perspective. <laughs> Luckily for us research-wise, when we got into the pre-behavioral activation phase and we're talking about the rationale, the psychoeducation for the treatment, having her just do some daily monitoring of her mood, uh, she kind of stabilized here at a level that was still clinically significant on the Beck Depression Inventory. So the question becomes now what happens when we implement activation? And here's what we saw. So the dashed line is her self-monitoring of the things I can do. So it's a version of that prior slide just for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where she would go through and track the activities that she engaged in. And so we see here that right out of the gate, she was starting to activate. Now, it took two weeks before we saw really any movement on her depressive symptoms there until we got that sort of upward spiral back going. She continued to be uh, highly active throughout the last month of treatment and her depressive symptoms dropped significantly during that time. A week after treatment, uh, her symptoms were also low and were maintained at one month follow-up. And our hope is that if she's now adopted the rule, when I face obstacles and feel down, activate and things will get better, would now help to promote maintenance and her not relapsing into that kind of a downward spiral in the future. So having seen kind of a clinical application in some detail, let's look at a few of the notable studies with respect to behavioral activation for depression. The first one I want to talk about is Neil Jacobson's uh, and colleagues' study from 1996. And it's hard to overstate how important this study was. At the time, uh, the cognitive revolution was in full swing, and behavior therapy had become cognitive behavior therapy. And if you didn't emphasize the cognitive elements in your treatment, it was as if you were selling your client short. So what Neil Jacobson did in this study is he did a component analysis where he looked at just behavioral activation compared to two aspects of cognitive therapy. So it was 152 adults who met criteria for depression 
were randomized to behavioral activation. So they got just the behavioral activation components of cognitive behavior therapy for depression. Another group got behavioral activation plus automatic thoughts restructuring, so strategies for dealing with specific negative thoughts as they arose. And then the other group got the full cognitive therapy package, where you got behavioral activation, automatic thoughts restructuring, and core belief modification, which was thought to be important, because here's when we were actually going to target the schema that kind of drove your negative information processing. Uh, here. And so what Jacobson found that was at the time quite striking and influential was that all the treatment groups did equally well. Right? And so we see here based on, this is the Hamilton rating scale for depression, the percent who were recovered, which is a stringent criterion, meaning you look like you're in the normal range on, your, on the measures, and improved uh, typically means a 50% reduction uh, in, uh, in symptoms. So whether it was recovered or improved, we saw no differences between the treatment. There was a slight numerical advantage for cognitive therapy, but nothing that was statistically significant at that point. So what this study set up was a follow-up study to compare behavioral activation to the full cognitive therapy package to antidepressant medication. And what they found among the least severe in the sample was that everybody did equally well. What was striking is what they found among those who were most severely depressed. And that was where behavioral activation did better than cognitive therapy and arguably better than antidepressant medication. Again, with 241 adults, 138 of whom were severe, and we see here again, whether it's remission or response, the more stringent or the less stringent recovery uh, measure, we see behavioral activation doing equally well and arguably better. This is the Beck Depression Inventory uh, percent, again, remission and response there. So maybe among our most severely depressed folks, uh, behavioral activation is particularly useful. And it's simpler and cheaper to deliver. This was a study uh, published in the journal Lancet, one of the top two or three uh, most influential medical journals in the world, where they took 364 adults who met criteria for depression, 78% of whom were on an antidepressant medication. At the time, they still met study criteria for enrollment. They were, randomized, they were from primary care and psychological therapy services, and they were randomized to get behavioral activation delivered by junior, low-cost mental health workers compared to cognitive therapy delivered by experienced therapists. And what they found was no difference, as you see over here, on recovery or response at 12-month follow-up. We have a method that works, and it's arguably cheaper and simpler to deliver. So the state of the evidence for behavioral activation, uh, as reviewed by the uh, Division 12 of the American Psychological Association, is considered to be strong research support for this intervention. We just spent a fair amount of time talking about an intervention that targets promoting adaptive tracking. Let's talk about an intervention that explicitly attempts to undermine ineffective rule control. And it's called acceptance and commitment therapy. Acceptance and commitment therapy's general functional analysis of psychopathology focuses on psychological inflexibility. And psychological inflexibility is likely to occur when there's excessive rule control by rules that cannot be followed. Right? So you're trying and trying and trying to follow a rule that can't be followed. Most of the time when this occurs, from an ACT perspective, we're dealing with rules that are trying to promote experiential avoidance. What is experiential avoidance? It's an attempt to avoid your own experiences, your own negative thoughts, feelings, memories, images, sensations. And so the idea here is that most of those kinds of rules are get rid of rules. I've got to get rid of this anxiety. I've got to get rid of this negative thought. I've got to get rid of this memory. Well, this is experiential avoidance, right? Well, avoidance is negative reinforcement. Well, reinforcement increases behavior. So here you have this rule that's designed to get rid of, but it's actually reinforcement. So what happens is, and we see this clinically in extreme cases, is it backfires, right? That the rule from the client is I need to get rid of my anxiety and worry. But the question we ask them is, what if the rule is if you don't want it, you've got it? And which rule seems to describe your experience with the world better? Right? So I'm going to give you an example, and it's an example we'll work through of a, a young adult client we treated who had been homebound for 10 months when she called our clinic. 
uh, and she'd been homebound because uh, it's a condition that in the DSM is called agoraphobia, where she was afraid to leave her house. Uh, and her rule that she told us was, if you don't feel comfortable and safe, you don't leave. And, and that was her rule. So you see in there, that's a, a need to be rid of anxiety, worry rule, right? I need to be rid of my anxiety and worry in order to leave the house. And so our question for her is, we see how that works in the short term, but that just sort of increases that behavior in the short run. What has it left you with in the long run? Is that really a, an accurate rule? Or could we summarize it this way? The more you've given into anxiety, the more it's taken. The more you've avoided, the more your life shrinks and the more control anxiety seems to have over you. Does that seem to fit? Okay. <clears throat> so if that's the case, we see here now uh, that we've got excessive control by rules that can't be followed effectively. And what those also do is prohibit control by rules that can be followed effectively and lead to positive consequences. And those, from an ACT perspective, are engagement in values-guided action. Right? So we'll ask the question, what would you be doing if anxiety wasn't a barrier? That's where we can be effective. Those are the kinds of things where we can actually, those are rules that can typically be followed. And for this client, we're going to go on to talk about what she wasn't doing because anxiety was a barrier, was getting prenatal care. She suspected at the time she called us that she was 10 weeks pregnant, hadn't been out of the house in 10 months, very much wanted to be uh, getting prenatal care, and, and very much valued being a good mother. And so that's what she would have been doing if she wasn't so anxious. <clears throat> So what are ACT's general rules for treatment that follow from that functional analysis? We're going to learn to accept private events, choose what's important to us, and take action based on those values. And that's the flip side of psychological inflexibility, which is psychological flexibility. We're going to weaken control by rules that support experiential avoidance, these rules that can't be followed effectively. That's where the treatment is called acceptance. That's the acceptance part of the treatment. And we have a range of acceptance and mindfulness techniques there that I'll give you just a flavor for in the coming slides to help people let go of the struggle to control unwanted thoughts and emotions. And then we're going to try to promote control by rules that specify values-based actions. That's the commitment part of the treatment. We're going to get you to commit to taking action towards the things that are most important to you. Friends, families, hobbies, self-care, school work. And here, any behavior change technique can be employed. And so what makes ACT a quintessentially behavioral treatment is that acceptance, mindfulness, and valuing must lead to actual concrete differences in the client's behavior towards those valued ends. This is not acceptance for acceptance's sake. This is behavior therapy. All right. So the psychological inflexibility slash flexibility model is typically now instantiated in, uh, in a six-process hexaflex model. I don't have the time to go through all of those processes today, but I want to give you a flavor for that by showing you how we might talk about that and all of the components with our client. And so here's kind of a client-specific functional analysis for our uh, homebound agoraphobic client. <clears throat> First is self as symptoms. Your self-concept is revolving around your symptoms. I'm an anxious person. And that promotes experiential avoidance. The sensations are too intense, uncomfortable for me. I can't handle them. They're too much. I need to get my emotions under control. Right? So those thoughts are treated as literal rules that I must follow. Right? I must get my emotions under control if I'm ever going to be able to do anything. Right? So again, notice that's that rule you can't follow. I've got to get my emotions under control if I'm ever going to be able to do anything that I want to do. So she was completely unable to engage in values-driven action. She very much wanted to go to the OBGYN. It wasn't a want problem, right, that she was struggling with. I can't have them present. I can't be in the moment with those thoughts and feelings. That is the essence of psychological inflexibility. So treatment is going to focus on the flip side of that coin, which is to build psychological flexibility. So the question we will ask is, Given a distinction between you and your anxious thoughts and feelings, right? you are not your anxiety. You are the container. You can, can you can hold any contents. You can hold Coke, Pepsi, water, hydrogen peroxide. You're the container. You can contain these. Uh, they are not you. Given this distinction between you and your anxious thoughts and feelings, are you willing to have the sensations fully and without defense as what they are, private events? often verbal, 
and not as what they say they are, things that must be gotten rid of, rules that must be followed. And do riding, driving, walking, what takes you in the direction of your chosen values of being a loving mother right here, right now. And that is the essence of psychological flexibility in the model we will pursue with the client. So to walk through her example, let's look at what some of that, those acceptance practices looked like for her. One of the things that was remarkable about this client is that she actually, at the end of the treatment, wrote sort of a narrative about her experiences of it. And I'm going to share just a few of her quotes with you. At first, we just did visualizations of what would be happening and how I would feel or what I would see as I was leaving the driveway. I really had to get into the mindset of it. We practiced just sitting in the car and then at the top of the driveway and then to the end of the road. I'd get nervous about all those things. My heart would race. I'd feel sweaty and my legs would feel numb. So notice the emphasis in there on acceptance and willingness. I mean, just visualize this and see what comes up for you. Right? We're going to go to the end of the driveway and just be with whatever your body gives you at that time. So uh, lots of practice in the early state of just being present to these thoughts and sensations. When the negative thoughts would come up, we would try to help her to distance herself from them, to diffuse from them. A couple of favorites for her. I can't stand it. This feels dangerous. What would we, how would we respond to that? How would our therapist who is working with her respond to that? How interesting. Looks like you're doing fine. Right? Separation between this verbal behavior and actual behavior. You just handled the last second. Let's see about the next second. Oh, whoops, you handled that second too. What about the next second? Right? Pointing her to adaptive tracking. You're handling it just fine, second to second here. Uh, we had, uh, our therapist had a really good rapport with her. Sometimes, sometimes she might say something like, I can't stand it. We say, good thing you're seated. Because right? she was in the car, right? Helping again to sort of pull out of that, sort of that verbal network of, uh, of the, all those rules, saying, I can't stand it. Um, Sometimes we would do validation with an acceptance twist. I'm sorry your mind is telling you that. We kind of expected your mind would say that, though, didn't we? Uh, and then ultimately we're getting back to how is behaving on those ideas worked out for you? Those are the ideas, those are the rules that are ineffective. Contact with the present moment. Here what you're teaching is basically what Skinner described as tacting. Right? You're teaching people to be in contact with what are the actual aspects of the nonverbal world that are present. Right? So we would help her. I'm sitting in a car, on the driveway, at the end of the road, with my heart racing, sweating, and my legs being numb. Those are tacks. That's literally what is happening. That's your experience. What is not happening is, I'm having anxiety. It's dangerous. It's so bad. I can't take it. That's verbal behavior about verbal behavior about verbal behavior. It's further and further extracted from contact with the real world of contingencies. What's happening in the real world? You're sitting in a car at the end of your driveway, sweating and feeling your legs numb. That's what's going on in the world and then helping her with the self as context. At each point pointing out, here you are noticing yourself, noticing these sensations, right? You are the one here as these verbal events play out, that you are bigger than all of these things. So as we got those acceptance practices in place, now is the time to increase committed action. And so the first thing for her was to increase her riding in the car, right? And so you see here these first data points are the ones where we were doing those acceptance practices. We weren't going very far. We were just sort of, again, go there and sit and work on those practices. And then our, we start to have our first kind of leveling off right here, just before this X down here. So what was going on there, that was when she rode to the OBGYN appointment with her boyfriend. So that was her first OB appointment right here. And the OB was six miles from home. So there again is our treatment goal driven by her values and what is it going to take to have an influence on your life. The, uh, after we got her there, you notice we had sort of an increase in the focus on riding in the car, a little bit of a dip here. But our next label stabilizing is right here, right before this open circle, which is when she rode to the hospital with her family to deliver a healthy infant uh, at that point, which was 14 miles from her home uh, there, which set up our next treatment target. She had had some success in riding with the car, had had those values-based goals met, uh, but she hadn't done a lot of driving and was wondering, and, and ex we thought about expanding her repertoire to be able to drive herself at that point. So you see, we didn't do a lot of that until we got this goal met, and then we targeted her actually driving herself uh, around. 
And so do we have any evidence there of adaptive rule control and psychological flexibility? <clears throat> what I realized is that before I left the house, my anxiety was always really high. And then after I started driving, it really dropped down. I'd be fine once I got to the location. It might spike again before I left, but it would go down again when I was driving. It was really liberating that I could plan to do things. I could drop my son off and it wouldn't matter if my anxiety increased. I had a foundation to know how to deal with the sensations should they arise. Again, here's our hope that that would persist uh, and maintain uh, the effects. Uh, and again, our follow-up data suggested that it did. So let's look at a couple of other notable studies on ACT for Anxiety, having introduced uh, the treatment and walked through uh, kind of a, a lengthy example. Again, why did we pick anxiety here? Uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, anxiety disorders are ranked as the sixth largest contributor to non-fatal health loss and appear in the top 10 causes of years lived with disability in all World Health Organization regions. Again, this attempt to target socially significant problems. <clears throat> Acceptance and commitment therapy has been demonstrated to be better than a wait list control condition and equal to the gold standard psycho psychosocial treatment cognitive behavioral therapy in the treatment of social anxiety. So again, we see here the percentage of folks experiencing clinically significant change, ACT was as good as cognitive behavioral therapy, and both were better than a wait list control condition. Here was a study looking at ACT against relaxation training for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and we see here that ACT, and I put an asterisk by ACT because this implementation of ACT um, did no in-session exposure. We already know in behavior therapy for obsessive compulsive disorder that you want to do exposures to the feared stimuli without letting the person engage in the compulsive response. They didn't do any of that specifically in this treatment. In this treatment, the only exposure was contact with values generated activities and whatever would come up for you when you did that. Uh, and so in terms of clinically significant change, 51% showing clinically significant change in eight sessions is a pretty brief uh, trial here uh, for this problem. This study actually set up a study where they did exposure and response prevention and then ACT plus exposure and response prevention. And that study, in fact, was just published in 2018, finding that ACT did equally well so, as exposure and response prevention. And what we see is exposure and response prevention is already a behavior therapy. What separates the two is how you talk to the client about the goal of behavior therapy. In standard exposure and response prevention, we tell them what treatment's going to do is try to reduce your anxiety and correct your irrational beliefs. That's not what we say in ACT. What we would say in ACT is this is an opportunity to practice acceptance of your obsessions and anxiety. And so it actually influences how we do the exposure. So in, here they do the exposures that people are monitoring their anxiety during the exposures and looking for it to go down and does it go down. In ACT, what people are monitoring is their willingness to experience anxiety and how does their willingness change during the course of the exposure. And what we see now is that both can be equally effective uh, interventions uh, for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. All right, so the state of the evidence for ACT. ACT has been evaluated in 250 randomized clinical trials and numerous single subject design studies. Several meta-analyses suggest its efficacy compared to wait list, psychological placebo, and treatment as usual controls. APA uh, suggested a strong research support for chronic pain. Well, that makes some sense if you've been following the model, right? What can you not ex escape if you have chronic pain? Where does a get rid of rule uh, been tried and not worked? Uh, probably in chronic pain. It has modest research support for depression and anxiety. Uh, modest research support even for psychosis, interestingly. And modest research support also for obsessive compulsive disorder, although you may note that the study I just mentioned was published in 2018, uh, so it was not included uh, in the, this evaluation. I suspect once it is that that actually may, uh, may go up. Because of the uh, evidence for behavioral activation and ACT, I focused on those two, but they do not, uh, they're not exclusively what clinical behavior analysis is uh, in terms of intervention. So here's a list of a, a range of uh, clinical behavior analytically oriented interventions and ones that are certainly consistent 
uh, with clinical behavior analysis. The one that I regret not having more time to talk about is functional analytic psychotherapy, uh, which really does target the therapy relationship as a set of direct acting contingencies, a social microcosm for interpersonal learning, and then you generate rules for daily life from the interactions you have with the therapist. Uh, but if folks are interested in additional reading materials, I have a, a number of them on this slide. Uh, the ones on the bottom here are uh, from a distinctive feature series. And what's useful about those is you can read them with an eye towards not what is behavior therapy broadly, but what's sort of distinctive about this particular uh, behavior therapy intervention. Uh, we see here uh, the gold standard treatment for Tourette syndrome, uh, managing Tourette syndrome up here, uh, and uh, dialectical behavior therapy, uh, Marshall Linehan's approach here, and Dave Barlow's uh, unified protocol for the treatment of emotion disorders. So, <clears throat> cognitive behavioral therapy built its name on treatments for depression and anxiety. Clinical behavior analytic interventions are proving to be their equal and might be better. This fact has had a major impact on clinical psychology. Right? We are now in what is somewhat controversial called the third wave of behavior therapy or the third generation of behavior therapy. And clinical behavior analysis has been a major player in having that happen. The interventions are based on principles and processes from behavior analysis, particularly findings related to the impact of verbal processes. Now, I just have to mention, in fairness, that I did oversimplify some things for this presentation, and I'll give some resources for folks who want to contact and do a more deep dive into some of the empirical and conceptual underpinnings. I didn't unpack much about why we think rules work and how is it that we understand rules working, right? So there's some work to be done there, and there's uh, some various perspectives on how that happens. I didn't unpack that uh, in this talk. And indeed, it's not like we know it all, or uh, we have it all there to unpack anyway. There's a lot of work that's left to be done on the interface of verbal stimuli and operant, operative environmental contingency. So if folks are interested in basic human operant research or translational research, there's a lot to be done in that area. There's also a lot to be done with our interventions. We have some things that we think work, and we think we've got some pretty good data there, but we've got to do better. We've got to reach more people. And we've got to reach people from all walks of life with our interventions. Indeed, the goal is a fully articulated process-based therapy that's less focused on protocols for syndromes and more focused on therapist competencies that are needed to assess and implement core behavioral procedures to influence specified behavioral processes linked to important life outcomes. I hope you could see just a little flavor of that sort of common process approach uh, in the, the contact with the rule governed behavior and contingency shaped behavior literature that I tried to outline today. If that was intriguing and interesting to you, here are some organizations where you might follow up to get some additional information or consider looking at the SIGs or the student uh, organizations there. ABAI has a clinical special interest group, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, uh, and the American Psychological Association, again, particularly Division 12, uh, which really has that repository of research-supported treatments. These are listed in alphabetical uh, order, by the way. Uh, here are uh, a number of uh, introductory readings if you're interested in a behavioral approach to verbal events. Uh, I won't walk through all of these, but if you get to these, the references included in these will get you into the next step of the literature, uh, I think. If you're interested in additional readings regarding behavioral activation and ACT, here are some follow-up readings there. A number of these are actually self-help books. And if you're particularly interested, a great way to experience these treatments is to experience them yourself, right? There's no defect model here. You're not different from your clients. You don't have to be to engage these things. They're often interesting as an experiential learning exercise to pick one of these up and go through it as though you are the client. It's a, it's a unique way to learn about the principles and processes. And then I have all of the additional references that I cited along the way. I thank you very much uh, and hope that you uh, have a little bit of an understanding of what clinical behavior analysis does. Thank you.